Welcome to the Free Speech Nation podcast with me, Andrew Doyle. Today, I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, Stephen Blackwood. Stephen is a philosopher and cultural commentator and the founder and president of Ralston College in Savannah. We talked about many things in our discussion, including the future of higher education, the nature of truth and beauty, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Thank you, Stephen, for joining me today. It's great to be here, Andrew. Thank you. Let's talk first about Ralston College. This is the college that you founded. Um, what was it that motivated you to create this entirely new institution, and, and how does it differ from other colleges? I'm just uh, one member of a team of people who's been involved in the founding of this mm -hmm. new institution. Um, by and large, I'd say just a couple of things. The first is that uh, I'm not a catastrophist. I don't think that you know, every institution is completely corrupt in every respect. There's lots of really intelligent and wonderful teachers and administrators and all kinds of things across the, let's say, the spectrum of higher education at, as, as, as a whole. Um, and I want to say that because the system is, in many respects, critically broken, dysfunctional, and at a writ large level has lost its way. And of course, you can look at that from any number of angles, certainly within the context of the United States. You can look at the, the wild escalation of costs, the student loan crisis, nearly two trillion in, in government-backed student loans in the United States now. Um, or you can look at it at an ideological level, the closing down of freedom of inquiry and free speech, of the, the, the a kind of indoctrinating spirit that's taken hold in certain disciplines especially, and of the way in which those, uh, that, say, closing down of the intellectual horizon uh, within the university, because the university is upstream of every other aspect of our culture, whether we're talking about the arts or architecture or, the me or media yes. or, 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 or policy, that closing down of the horizon closes down the horizon of everything else as well. So our view fundamentally is that uh, the best remedy to any stagnant in industry is simply to show that it can be done better in a name, in a word, competition. That is to say, competition from superior alternatives. Every institution of higher education in the history of all civilizations had a beginning at some point, and there's no reason we can't begin again now. And you're onto something, I think, because there is a genuine intellectual curiosity among young people, and they really do crave uh, these kind of challenges, which they, uh, I, I would say a lot of people are saying, they're not getting at the moment. I mean, Peter Bogosian's resignation letter from Portland State, you, you'll have read this, um, he, he says that the students there, and he is talking about that specific institution, but he says the students there are not being trained how to think, they're being trained to mimic uh, the ideological certainties of the staff. Um, and is that, is that a view that you share? Largely, yes. I think that to begin with, I think that <clears throat> though it is easy to criticize some of the the easily taken on kind of indoctrinated positions that young people uh, have, I really don't think young people are the problem. I mean, uh, young people are by and large no different now, though of course cultures change and contexts change than they have ever been. And the problems that we're seeing through the kind of reductive and reactionary positions that are sometimes taken up by young people, uh, perhaps increasingly now, actually have their origins upstream of them. They're, from, they're getting them from their teachers or from the media or whatever. And so I think we have to think long and hard about the problem that that, that, that points to. And the problem that points to is that uh, uh, we're failing to give them uh, richer alternatives. And that's is that, really... Is that what Ralston College does? Uh, is that where you will be separate? and different from the existing... Well, well yes, absolutely, but, you know, our, our, largely speaking, our commitments should not seem contradistinctive, but, but in fact, they, they now appear contradistinctive simply to declare an absolute dedication to freedom of inquiry, yes. uh, you know, with, without any restrictions at all. That, uh, sadly, seems, uh, seems contradistinctive today relative to the, the spirit and uh, policies of many universities, even though it's obvious to any idiot that you can't have... A, that the university itself is premised on that very commitment. You can't have exactly. any... University at all without freedom of thought and the free speech that allows you to convey those thoughts to each other. Well, that's why I think so many people are baffled because the, the default expectation of a higher education institution is that it is for free inquiry and free speech, uh, or, or it should be. That should be the default expectation. But, uh, but unfortunately, in the, today's climate, that isn't the way, that, certainly, that's not the way that universities are perceived. Do, do you think there is a, uh, do you think this stuff is ever exaggerated? Do you think there is a difference between this perception we have of, of, of universities stifling free expression, free inquiry, uh, to what is actually going on? 
yes, I think it would be wrong for us not to have, to, to accuse others of being reductivist and not nuanced if you, our own critique were not somehow also yes. sufficiently nuanced. And so I think it, as you well know, there's a huge range uh, within the whole, we might say we say within the, within the spectrum of higher education from places that are, you know, have downright and openly betrayed their fundamental mission uh, to places that are, are really uh, very sound. Now, it's often hard to tell just where a place is on the spectrum because the one of the challenges we're facing both uh, within the university and within our culture at large is that it takes only a fairly small minority to bully or intimidate a larger group into say, silent non-resistance. Yeah. And that's death at the university because, it, because once you're there, then it doesn't, actually doesn't matter in a way if legally you can still speak your mind if the spirit of the culture at that institution is such that you're too afraid to do so. so but I think it needs to be said that if you look, for example, at the University of Cambridge, here I am, uh, here we are, of course, speaking in London tonight, uh, one of the, the, the one of the very greatest universities in the world with nearly a thousand years of history. <clears throat> when I was at Cambridge a couple of years ago, I certainly got the sense from some of my friends there that though there had been some high profile cancellations, they, they had a strong intuition that nonetheless, they said this is not characteristic of the university. Uh, the vast majority of scholars here are very serious, intellectually honest, just want to go about their business. And yet there was also a sense in which which these high profile cancellations, so to speak, mm. had significantly altered how they themselves felt within that landscape. And then of course it was the, uh, the vote at Cambridge uh, nearly two year and a half ago or so, the, the, the grace uh, that was, uh, had three amendments to a, to a motion. A motion to change the language of an amendment, if I've understood this correctly, to saying that, we, that one must respect others' beliefs and positions yes. rather to a language of tolerance, to say we must tolerate, allow them to be even though we agree, whether we agree with yes, them or not. I we don't have to respect this, yeah, them. Yeah. And so it was essentially uh, a motion on, on, on free inquiry and freedom of speech. Yes. And it was not even close to close. Uh, something like 86 or 7 percent of people voted, of members of the university voted in favor of this, this most basic thing. So the point is, is that, is that you know, one might have, if one was viewing the University of Cambridge, for yeah. example, through the lens of a certain say high profile cancellation, you might have said, well, all is lost, it's, it's given over to ideology. But in fact, when came time for a secret ballot vote of the university at large, it was vastly uh, in favor of the fundamental but principles. But it was a secret ballot. And I think that makes it's, a difference, doesn't it? It, 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 it does. Uh, the reason I think this is so important for University of Cambridge is that now that has been enshrined as the position, it makes it much more difficult to, I mean, I think in fact now it would be downright against university policy to cancel someone for, to withdraw an invitation to anyone. Yes. Uh, unless there was something illegal sure. about the invitation, obviously. So whereas before they rescinded the invitation to Jordan Peterson, now they're saying, well, clearly on completely specious grounds. I mean, that was it, a, completely. That was a, a, as uh, Dr. Arif Ahmed has said, a stain on the university's uh, reputation. One that it seems as though they are uh, on the verge of of, of clearing yes. uh, by the 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 invitation of Dr. Peterson, as I gather, to back to Cambridge later this fall. I mean, it was just under pressure from activists, effectively. It seemed, from the little I know, it seems to me that uh, it was driven fundamentally on ideological grounds yeah, yeah. by a very small uh, coterie of people who perhaps they were simply misinformed but who took upon themselves to put a great deal of pressure to cancel an invitation that had not only been made but it was it was a it was a fellowship for which yes. a, Dr. Peterson had had uh, applied it required references a statement of work uh, as it happens I was in uh, in the same uh, faculty in parallel applying for the same kind of fellowship and so I know the, what the process was very clearly which yes. required academic references, a statement of work, a CV, etc, cetera, etc cetera. and uh, uh, the fellowships were awarded in a completely conventional manner and then only after the fact in, in Peterson's case rescinded. So the point is is that it was a uh, it was both a radical uh, a betrayal of the university's own process yes. uh, and one that was uh, effected by a t 
tiny group of people putting pressure at just the point at which that fellowship could be rescinded. I mean, that's my point is that it, is, it only takes a few people because they are so intimidating and so powerful. Um, how can you, in establishing Ralston College, how can you ensure that your institution won't similarly be uh, infected by this kind of uh, toxicity? I think at some fundamental level, Cambridge has got it right, which is to say the governing body has now proclaimed a, you know, a very broad uh, support for the principle of freedom of speech and inquiry on which the university rests mm. and enshrine that in such a way that it will be very difficult now for minority actors to, to undo that commitment. So is it as simple as that, just the authorities have to not capitulate to the demands of a minority? Well, certainly that's our view at Rolston College, is yeah. that there will always be competing views, there will always be pressures, there will always be, be various kinds of intimidation or whatever, and uh, so I would say there, it takes two forms fundamentally. The first is that it, it must absolutely have a clear uh, policy, a radical, you might say, radical in the sense of root commitment to freedom of speech and inquiry on which the university's whole, whole life is premised. So that's, a, you might say, a formal commitment, and that needs to be upheld by the governing bodies, by the, by the board or whatever faculty governance at, 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 at Ralston College, it's board, but it could be any, any other number of governing structures that must absolutely protect that. But then I think it needs to be said it's not simply enough to have a formal commitment. I mean, in the United States, for example, right now, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a strong constitutional right to freedom of speech. That's, yes. that's the First Amendment of the American Constitution. There's no reasonable likelihood, at, at the moment at least, it seems extremely remote, that that is going to be uh, uh, undone. The point I'm making is that the, the formal commitment is secure there, and yet there's a great deal of fear in the United States around speaking one's mind. And so what that goes to, sh to show you is that though the, the, the constitutional legal formal structure is essential, it's a necessary but not a sufficient condition to cultivate a culture in which you actually freely can speak your mind. And so I think the second part of how you maintain a culture of these things at the university in addition to the formal commitment has to be one that takes real genuine thoughtful care as to, to maintaining an environment yes. in which, which all of us are, are seeking to get to the truth of things. And that, re that requires both having the courage to say what you think, but also having the humility to not only listen to others, but to, to openly wonder and, and be open, and, and in fact, even to rejoice when you're wrong. Because it's better to be closer to what's, what's true and right than further from it. It's not merely a legal formal commitment um, uh, any more than you could say, you know, we, we want to appreciate beauty could be merely formal. You need, still need to have a culture in which you, you introduce people to the arts and to nature and to, you know, the beauty of a lyric or a mellifluous uh, bit, of, bit of song. Because yeah. without, without actually the thing itself, the, form, the formal commitment is empty. It's interesting that you talk about, the, uh, it's what John Stuart Mill described as the, the tyranny of prevailing opinion and this idea of a culture in which, a kind of monoculture where, where there is no possibility for dissent. What sort of things, what, how will you be able to put this into place, into practice in a university to ensure that there is this free exchange of ideas, that people are willing to be challenged and actually enjoy being challenged? One has to declare one's commitments openly at any institution. Yes. And the, the first thing I would say is that if you do that openly and honestly and very clearly, you will be able to signal to those who want that yep. that this is an institution at which that will take place. And so at that level, I think that the intake or application procedure is going to be one in which we, we have clearly already in a very significant way begun to attract those who are seeking, mm. uh, not a place where they can just say anything on the top of their mind, but actually yeah. what, it, it's, the, it's the bedrock uh, seeking of the truth that, de that, on which, that depends on that principle of freedom of speech. It's all the ways in which that, that freedom of the mind takes place at every, I mean, it's at the, at the scaling throughout the institution. So both in terms of how a conversation in the classroom takes place or with a member of faculty, but also the, which defines the overall, you might say, spiritual context and content of the institution. So that whether it's dining or uh, clubs or the, the various associations that, that, that to which university communities have paradigmatically given rise to, whether it's drama or, or, or debate or, or, or walking about the countryside or whatever. The, the point is, is that 
that the, the freedom with which we seek the truth is one expression of a fundamental, you know, what I would say is a fundamental human nature. And that nature needs to be protected and preserved and uh, cultivated mm. at every level of an educational institution to the best of its ability. Of course, it's, it's, it is an educational institution, not a company, not, a, uh, not, a, not an outdoor organization, not whatever, whatever, not a political entity. Uh, so it has a particular uh, uh, raison d'etre. But at the same time, the great universities and great collegiate communities, of which we have many, many wonderful examples here in the United Kingdom, um, have not simply been about books. They've been fundamentally about books and reading and the pursuit and transmission of knowledge, but they've also given rise to, to a larger uh, humane life for the student and for those other members of the community that is able to embrace and support ourselves more broadly. Your emphasis on truth, I think, is very important. And I've heard um, people describe the current uh, critical social justice ideological movement or whatever people, however people want to describe it, as, as the counter-enlightenment or being, being against the principles of the enlightenment. And when you're faced with uh, a, a worldview that is quite dismissive of the very notion of truth or believes that there are multiple ways of knowing, to use the phrase that is often used, or indeed, uh, more colloquially, the idea of lived experience, how can you uh, push back against that? I mean, I'm, I, I find myself in endless debates with these activists, and because they don't think that the truth really matters, uh, they're, they're not willing to substantiate what they say with any recourse to empirical evidence they, because it doesn't matter to them. What matters to them is the, is the, is the ideology, is the worldview. So how, how can you push back against something like that? Because I don't know how you persuade someone out of that position because it just it feels, it feels so obviously untenable to me. Well, I think that's a very good and important question. Well, for many reasons. Uh, the, the first is... I think the first thing that needs to be said, if we sort of slow down and take this bit by bit, mm -hmm. is that the position is itself fundamentally contradictory. I mean, you can't, as is often pointed out, you can't both assert the truth of these things yes. and not be putting yourself within some kind of context in which truth matters. Uh, and so, you know, the most uh, reductivist activist is, I think it needs to be said, is pretty committed to the veracity or the, the power of the insight that uh, he or she is, 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 a, is advocating. And yeah. so if that person is willing to be intellectually honest, there, there, there has to be possible a kind of conversation. Well, if you would say this, well, then would you say that? And well, what are the goal, what, what you have to ask, for example, what are the goals that you are seeking to achieve by taking this standpoint? Is the protection of this minority or the, 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 the cessation of this particular perceived injustice or whatever? So I, I, I suppose what I would say is that I think that one, one needs, first of all, to admit the possibility that larger conversation in which we are all already swimming. Second would say, if that's not possible, uh, then you know the whole the whole enterprise of human culture at some level comes to an end, and yeah. so I think you're you're radically right to say that the possibility and the nature of truth itself is really what is at stake here. Everything else is subordinate to that, and that doesn't mean let's take lived experience for example. Yeah, I mean. Only a fool would say that the lives that we live don't give us insight into the, to the nature of, of, sure. of, of what's real. And so I think that one can even affirm in that sense the, na the notion that in and through our experience, we do gain access to, to deep and powerful things, whether it's the nature of love or injustice or beauty or whatever. I mean, we have only our own selves, you might say our own thinking apparatuses, our minds, are the, the totality of our personalities through which we can access anything outside of ourselves. Yes. We should oppose, simply speaking, truth and experience. But what we, what we should oppose is the, na is the notion that our experience is totally solipsistic and internal and yeah. doesn't open up onto the horizon of a stable reality. And so what I think the opportunity is actually with young people today is, is actually to show them that the nature of their own thinking, this is of course Plato's famous, uh, 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 this is what the whole direction of, of Plato's work moves in, is to show that in the very nature of your own thinking and perceiving within the nature of your own subjectivity, your own personhood, you are already opened up intrinsically to the objectivity uh, of, of the world at large. And so, so in fact, these are not simply opposed, but rather in a back and forth, let's say, dialectic in which you go deeper into the self, but also deeper into the world. And, it, but, and, and when, you, when you, in an activist way, define yourself against the world, 
it's, it's, it's game over because you've, you've defined your own subjectivity, your own freedom, your own, your own personhood in, in opposition to the totality of the real world, of the world beyond your own immediate, immediate perceptions. And that's a, that's a route to unhappiness and uh, unfulfilled uh, impermanence. I think that's the problem because if, uh, when people are talking about lived experience, what they meant by that is we should acknowledge and recognize uh, the significance that subjectivity can have uh, and, and personal experience of certain circumstances and, and the, the light that that can shine on certain things. That would be one thing, but that's not what the discourse of lived experience relates exactly. to. It, it, what it, what it, it's as you put it, solipsistic. It's this idea that uh, my perception of the world ought to be prioritized over everyone else. I mean, I've even seen uh, the notion of objectivity in of itself being problematized as a sort of uh, w uh, white supremacist construction, for instance. Now, that's, that's obviously not the case. Well, I mean, it, it, the, the brick wall is you know, hard and going to you know, kill you at 60 miles an hour, uh, whether you think it's there or not, you know, it. whether you want it to be there or not, whether, it, whether your lived experience leads you to believe that it's hard or not. Those things are all completely independent of your, uh, your, your, the immediacy of your perception. What needs to be said, though, is that you know, by those standards, I mean, if the standard of my engagement in the world has to be that it never question or challenge or, or deepen yeah. what I already know, I mean, that's, that's, that really is to condemn yourself to a world in which, you know, love is not possible, you know, any sense of, of uh, justice outside of your own being is not possible. It, it, it is also to condemn yourself to a kind of, to the immediacy of your own perceptions at any given moment in time. And, and I think what, what I, mean, I don't think these things can be entirely separated from larger cultural realities, from the, the rise in depression and suicide in the young, from broadly speaking the, 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 the dissolution of our civic life, from the sense of alienation in the modern world, uh, from, the, the, from what some people would call I think a good shorthand is uh, from the meaning crisis, from the sense that, that many, many people are struggling to make sense of life in a way that's adequate to their own inner nature. And, and so, so the point is, is that I think the, those who are talking about the, about, let's just say, lived experience are right to the extent that these larger truths need to be understood within us. Yeah. But you, you can't have, you by definition can have no access to them if the terms of your engagement stop at, you know, the edge of your your yourself. Well, like, it's the negation of reality is not is not actually beneficial, even if you're coming coming at it from a purely selfish perspective. It's not good for you. I mean, it, it might be a comfort for certain people to believe that sex is on a spectrum rather than binary, but you can't wish away chromosomes at the end of the day. That that's not something that you can you can do. So, at the heart of the scientific inquiry, truth has to at least be the goal. Does of it? course, of course. To say otherwise is to give up on the whole prospect of any of, of conversation, of of social life, yeah. of political life. It is good, I think, at some point, to remind ourselves of the basic facts of our empirical existence. That's yeah. why I talk about the brick wall. That's why it, you know, it's important to talk about chromosomes, uh, chromosomes, and, and, and things of that sort. It needs to be said that there are large aspects of our of our of our worlds that are constructed that are given rise to by the choices we make yeah. but but even those are embedded within larger realities that are that are not simply subjective whether it's the brick wall or the chemical reaction or the nature of these realities external to us is utterly independent of what we might want or feel or want to be true. I mean, there was yeah. a certain point in time at which people thought that you know, the world was, was flat. And they were quite invested in the world being flat and really wanted flat. And you really wanted you to believe that it was so. Yeah. But none of that had a goddamn thing to do with whether, in fact, it was actually f flat or yeah. not. The point is, is that if you, define, if, you, if you refuse to engage in the whole process of the discovery of the reality of things, by limiting it according to what you yourself are, are, are immediately willing to, to assent to, you, it needs to be said, you are putting yourself in a very uh, fundamentally uh, insoluble position. A lot of people listening to you now will, will I'm sure, realize how this pertains to science and maths, etc. 
Um, but less so maybe when it comes to the arts and the humanities and uh, beauty, as you put it, and artistic expression. In, in, in this realm, uh, th there is more scope for subjectivity in the notion of truth and the notion of interpretation. Uh, how do you think uh, this relates to the arts? Gosh, that's a, <clears throat> that's a great question and one that, that philosophers and theologians and psychologists and others, artists, painters, have been reflecting on in a way that question is the fundamental question of humanistic inquiry, right? I mean, how is what we are and how we understand ourselves, you know, related to, you know, the deepest paradigms or patterns of reality itself? Yes. And in a way, all the humanities are, are the record of other human beings reflecting on that question through time. Yes. I mean, that's, that's, what, that's fundamentally what they are. And the reason it's important to read them is because, not that they give a damn, I mean, those, those people are dead. Yeah. <laughs> but because the books are like spotlights that can be turned on and illuminate us now. Yes. Uh, not that we need to be constrained by them or, or subject to them in some absolute way, but simply because you know, if you're setting off to cross the Atlantic in a, in, in a boat and you have to build it yourself, but you're not allowed to look at any paradigms of other boats that have ever been built yeah. or use any of the instruments that have been developed to do that, or you know, if you're setting off to build a building and you're not allowed to look at any, to read any works of architecture or look at any works of architecture, where you're robbing yourself of the vast um, resources that are present to your life now. And so anyway, the, to get back to your question, you know, which is really about the, the relation between our sense of self, our subjectivity, our self-knowledge on the one hand, which, which is by definition an internal state. I mean, it's, it's, it's mine and not yours, it's yours and not, you know, yeah. not someone else's. Um, and what is the relation of that and you might say the objectivity of reality that is the question that lies right at the heart of, I would say, what's going on in, 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 in the ancient Greeks, in, in Homer, in the tragedians, in Aristotle and Plato, and largely that is the, the, the nature of that, that question is, is what gives rise to the whole reflection in the Western tradition, not to say it's not present in other cultures, but the West is the, the civilization I uh, can speak somewhat comfortably about. That first. Second, let's say that it's important to be willing to, to engage the same kind of critical thinking or self-reflective analysis. Yeah. But what, and then we say, well, what do we say about beauty? Because we know that the experience of beauty is a, at some level, by definition, a subjective experience. Mm -hmm. So then you say, well, does that, is that all that it is? Uh, is it just you know, my feeling or your feeling or you know, in the eye of the beholder or, yeah. or whatever? Um, but I think serious thought about what beauty is leads you into, into seeing that there are questions of symmetry and parallel and balance and... Well, that's, uh, I mean, the Walter Paters of this world would say that it's not wholly subjective. Exactly it, so. It, do you have any sort of, uh, do, do you have any sympathy with that perception? Well, I would say that, that uh, though I don't know Pater well, I would say that's completely right. It's not simply subjective. That what I would, what I think needs to be acknowledged is that those realities are as perennial, as, as, as abiding, as enduring, and as knowable as the, the, the nature of, of the physical world. Yes. And just because there's an ideology that would have us believe that they're not there, I mean, you can look, architecture is a good example. I mean, you can you look through all times and places, and in fact, all cultures, and see that there are certain principles of symmetry and balance and so on that are emerging, which certainly suggests strongly that those are not merely subjective, but have, have an objective basis, not merely the result of the imagination of a particular time, but are themselves grounded in, 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 in abiding, let's say, metaphysical or ontological realities to which we have access. But I would go further than that, and I think, uh, I wonder what Peter would say. It'd be nice to ask him about this. <laughs> we would have no access to those, though, Andrew, if we ourselves did not have a structure, a character, a nature that allowed us to have access to them. And so this is where we come back to truth. What we're trying to bring together here are the fact that there really is an objective world, there are truths that can be known, yes. but also that they can be known by us. And so the, the point of a culture, uh, the point of, a, of a, any civilization worth anything, mm. is that it has to elevate the individual to 
be able to know him or herself in relation to these, these deeper and uh, uh, enduring realities. I'm interested in the way in which, uh, I mean, you mentioned architecture and beauty and these kind of things, what they tell us about a culture. I mean, if you, sit, you, know, if you, if you go and see the Parthenon, you get a sense of some, there's something that that is expressing about that culture, about the culture from which it emerged. But there's also a reciprocal of, I know Roger Scruton's written a lot about this, the way in which actually architecture in of itself has an impact on the culture. It actually has an impact in terms of creating a society. And he says, you know, if you have ugly buildings, you, you can create an ugly mind, in other words. You can foster the climate within which ugliness can... Um, and I don't mean that, but you know what I mean yeah. by that. Uh, yeah. do, you have, do you think that he's right about that? I think the late Sir Roger is completely right about that. Not only that there's an objectivity to, the, to, to what is beautiful, um, but that, if I can put it this way, the objectivity of those things is known because they resonate in us. And so you know, there's, a, there's a great sense, if you talk about the Parthenon, for example, scholars of architecture could certainly describe to us how patterns in nature, whether it's the, the golden ratio or whatever, are themselves built into the building yeah. and they're built into us. And so, I mean, the, the Parthenon is a great example of, being, of, of having of one of many examples, and it's a paradigmatic and very influential example of how the building itself is built so that we can perceive those, uh, let's say, structural relations, but also come to know ourselves in that. I mean, when you, yeah. when you approach a great building, I mean, there's a sense in which you become part of that harmony. And I'd say the same about listening to a piece of music. I mean, what is music other than our listening to it, right? I mean, it doesn't exist outside of the listener. And the, and, and, and the listener is only ever at you know, this moment or that moment or that moment of the piece. Yes. But the piece doesn't make sense in that sense, right? It only makes sense, you know, the resolution of the, of the chord only makes sense because you have the, 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 the tension of what happened just before in it, because you hold the line of melody in your head. What Art is is the the bringing of us into those patterns and paradigms and truths and and I want to come back to what you said about the way in which the the architectural or the artistic let's say generally is yep. formative because I think we're living in a very exciting time I think you know before Roger died of course he was he played a role in the uh, I've forgotten exactly the name of the commission. It was a commission but, for, be, be, uh, be, for beautiful buildings. In fact, what, I yes. can't remember what it was called, yeah. though. I think it was, it was a spe specifically, specifically dedicated to thinking about the vernacular. Yeah. So how there could be you know, recreated or given rise to here in Britain a, a vernacular, that is to say, a, 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 not just the museums and the buildings built by you know, public funds for you know, famous uh, structures, but rather you know, a model or mode for building everything from public housing to, yes. to, to, to anything else that would be elevating and beautiful. And I think one of the reasons this is such an important point is because we're at a point in culture in which you know, there's a huge demand. I mean, when we talk about the meaning crisis, there's a huge demand for a recovery of <clears throat> Forms of life and culture that are adequate to our nature, and you know, I, think, I don't think it's any secret that there's very high levels of anxiety, of you know, fear, of of uh, uh, division and alienation. And so the question, I think, the challenge and the opportunity is that it's not about returning to the past. I don't ideal, idealize or idolize the past. Rather, it's about looking to see what are paradigms that we might recover and reassert and reinvent yes. now in our time. I mean, we have to have the courage to have the creativity to you know, think through the actual problems that we're facing as, 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 as a culture. That's one of the reasons that freedom of thought is so essential, is that we have work to do. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do this honestly and seriously, um, uh, those who come after us will have an even more debased and degraded culture than we do. And so the exciting thing about our time is that we have an opportunity to freely reinvent and recreate uh, the, the, the forms of life and culture that will elevate and realize uh, uh, each of us and those who come after us. So what do you make of the argument that uh, beauty in art or architecture or any of these kind of things has always been an expression of the, the, the powerful, has always been uh, uh, a, a certain type of ideal which is, which is that which, which perpetuates the power of who, who is ever in control at any given time? 
Hence the decolonization of the curriculum. Hence the idea that, uh, the, 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 that these are just dead white males asserting their power and, and that, we shouldn't, that we should be open to different forms of beauty because it's more inclusive. Well, I, I'm pro-openness. I mean, I think anyone who, who, who knows anything at all knows that uh, only by being open to the world can you discover its depth. And yeah. so, you know, I think it would be very wrong to say that, you know, there's some, that only what has been said in the past can be said in the future, or only what has been thought to be set beautiful in the past can be considered beautiful now. The question of power is, has always been at the heart of, of thinking seriously about the human experience. Mm. I mean, how do we check the powerful? How do we check our own, you know, will to, to domination? Yeah. I mean, how do we, how do we put a, provide a check on self-will? I mean, that, that's a question that, that has been with us since the very beginning. It gives rise to the whole moral life, to the, to, the, to the centrality of humility in the Christian tradition, and so on and so forth. But, but, but all that is to say that, um, that I find the idea that these great works of art or music or architecture uh, must be discarded simply because they were the works of uh, the powerful. First of all, it's often untrue. It's mm -hmm. not true that, that every artist of the past, I mean, there were many, many, many people who died in penury, whose works were not discovered for, for a long time after, who gave, of them, who gave everything they had to make these things and died thinking that no one would ever hear or see or read it. Yes. So for God's sakes, we need, first of all, to say this argument is specious from the beginning. Yes. Um, and second, um, though I'm, I'm always game for asking the question about, well, you know, what are the influences and, and how do we provide a check on, on power and so on, that what I really find insidious about this whole direction of travel is, what it, it is, is, is that the, uh, the ultimate effect of it is to deny these great <clears throat> works of beauty, of music, of architecture or whatever, to deny those to us now. And the fact that I think that I think is, is just reprehensible is the notion that somehow the, the poor or the dispossessed or the disenfranchised, mm. that they themselves uh, are not seeking participation in those uh, or don't have the capacity to appreciate those very things. My view at the end of the day is that, uh, uh, I'm gonna give you two quick metaphors. Mm. You know, I think that every human being is made for the mountaintop. And it's a question of you know, how you come to understand that you are made for those highest and best things and that they were made for you. I mean, that clearly has got to be the measure of any civilization you know, worth anything at all. Is, is it able to take you know, human beings who start here as infants and bring them into some sense of what they're made for and what they're capable of and what, you know, what, what's it, bringing what's in them out into the world such that they can live you know, free and fulfilled and, 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 and beautiful lives. And the second in, in metaphor I want to give you, this first in the mountaintop, the second, I've been thinking about this quite a bit and trying to find you know, what, you know, what are metaphors that seem adequate to this deep mystery of human realization, but which is also like, it's the nature of all of our lives. I mean, we're, we're self, we're, we're, we've evolved to self-conscious creatures and you know, human life isn't worth anything at all if you, know, you experience life as miserable and short and enclosed and, and deadly and ugly. Yeah. I mean, the truth of a culture is, is in its ability to open those things up and not for the few, but for, but for, but for the all. And so the metaphor I wanna give you is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, there's this famous violin maker that most people have heard of called uh, Stradivarius yep. a couple of hundred years ago. You know, he pr produced these instruments that are just kind of you know, miraculous. And, and so the metaphor I want to give you is that, is that every human being is a Stradivarius, is, is an instrument that's made to, to, to play a music that only he or she can play. Um, uh, but the challenge is, um, how do you learn to play it? And, and that doesn't mean that, uh, of course it doesn't mean that uh, most of us don't have the, the, the talent to become a J.S. Bach or a Shakespeare or a, uh, uh, a Jane Austen or whatever. Um, but what it does mean is that those highest and best things are made for us, and so we can hear that music. You can be a Stradivarius unknowingly, and you can think, well, what is this piece of wood? Is it, a, is it an ax? Is it a shovel for the garden? And I think the truth is, is that many, uh, many, many, many of, uh, of us, of our, of our fellow human beings, find themselves living in a kind of state of you know, darkness or unhappiness or a certain kind of you know, oppressive weight of, uh, of things about which we need to think very carefully because 
our culture needs to be judged according to whether it provides the avenues and the forms of life and culture such that that which is in you, that instrument that you're made to be, no matter how humble it is, mm. can, like the bow in the Odyssey when Odysseus plucks it, that it sings. So you're actually presenting an anti-elitist argument Yes. Here. And of course, the irony of that, I suppose, is that a lot of people would accuse your perception of being elitist insofar as if you have uh, a view that, uh, that some cultural achievements are better than other cultural achievements, the cultural relative would say that's not possible. The relativist would say uh, there's no such thing as an objectively beauty, uh, beautiful work of art. And, and, but it strikes me that this is a kind of fundamental misunderstanding. When um, Sheffield University put out a video last year saying that the only reason we study Shakespeare is because he was wh a white male, and he was exerting his power. That strikes me as the elitist argument. It's not opening things up is. to, to everyone. No, of course, and I think it needs to be said. <clears throat> I mean, you can go through, just looking at the West, you can go through many of the high watermarks, and they were profoundly de de democratized. I was in Athens a couple of years ago, the great pleasure to go to Greece, and you know, anyone with eyes to see can see the Parthenon exactly. up there in the hill, and you can walk up and you can walk through it. And that has been the case for the better part of you know, 2,500 years. Yes. You know, Homer, you know, the, the works of Homer were, were sung, at, you know, were recited by rhapsodes at the, 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 the Feast of Athena called the Panathenia. The, the works of Homer were made for everyone. That's funny yes. what Greek education was. Let's go to, let's go to uh, the great cathedrals and churches of the Romanesque and Gothic er eras, you know, some, some of them here even standing in, in, in London. I mean, Anyone who wanted to walk in could go and experience those buildings. Let's think of the works of Shakespeare that uh, you know, were performed just a couple of miles from here at the, at the Old Globe. I mean, those were in fact actually written. I mean, the whole economic principle of the theater was that people wanted to go and listen to That's it. Right. And you know, the works of J.S. Bach, the cantatas, I mean, they were, they were written for a parish church. I mean, the, you could, you know, the works of Dickens, people used to wait, I learned this recently, I think I've got this right, they used to wait as the ships were coming in into New York to pick up you know, the next uh, installment, or the next episode of the, of the, so I just completely reject the idea. I mean, that's what I mean by the mountaintop. The greatest works are, are precisely known to be great works yeah. because they, they, they unlock and speak to you know, every man. Yes. And, and you know, I, 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 was, I told uh, someone a story recently about being at the, uh, the Globe Theater. This became you know, very uh, poignantly real to me. Uh, a member of my extended family, little higher education, and we wanted to go to the Globe, and she didn't want to go uh, because she, she, she th you know, I think she felt embarrassed that she wouldn't appreciate it. You know, Shakespeare was for you know, the smart people, or right. the, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the educated people. And I can't remember which, I think it was Richard III. I can't remember exactly which play it was. Um, uh, and here I was with my PhD and you know, whatever else. Anyway, we, we persuaded her in the end to go in. And, I, and I, I'm not making it up to say by the, by, the, by the intermission, she was way more deeply into the play than I was, had a, had a, had a much better grasp on the characters and what was going on and who was doing what than I did. And, and, and for me, that was both a happy moment to see that a person very dear to me had, had come to see that this beautiful thing was for her. Yes. Um, but it was also, also for me a, 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 an obvious ratification of the fact that Shakespeare was not written for the few. And I think that those who think you're right to say that the, the real elitists, the real elitists are those who want to take those works away from everyone else. That's my belief. Yeah, that, that, that I, I hear this all the time. That well, well, a young child of a certain ethnicity say can't possibly connect with Shakespeare because he was white, and it's to reduce. It's so, it's so reductive. And I, I really like what you're saying about it. it's not just about the artist. I mean, you could say yes, I suppose when Shakespeare died, he was the equivalent of a millionaire. You know, he was very, very wealthy. Um, but that's not the case with all artists. William Blake died in absolute penury as well. You know, it's not just about them. It's about the legacy they leave behind. And I think when we talk about the canon, so much of discussions about the canon of English literature, say, have, have come down to these questions of, well, who were the powerful ones, who were not, and, not, and less about so their boring. impact. boring. It is boring, but it's, it also forgets the impact of, the, of artists themselves in the formation of the canon, influences that can, that can be seen over time, and, and why certain works of art uh, spark something in someone, and, and how important and beautiful that that is. And we seem to miss this yeah, at the moment. Yeah, I, th I, think you could, I think you're completely right, and I think we, it, this, this does go back to this whole question of the relationship between the subjective and the objective. And I would just you know, to, to, to very quickly say that I think you can approach these things, um, for example, through, through, you know, through the idea of justice. You know, there's a lot of talk about justice now and it's in, in lived experience and so on and so forth. But, but 
anyone is capable of having a serious conversation about what justice really is. Yeah. And when you, when you perceive, when you, you know, we've, all seen, you know, we've all seen or heard of terribly in, unjust things happening. We know that objectively there is, there is a wrongdoing there. Yeah. And it's completely possible to, to, to come to a rational grasp of why that is so and what justice must be. The impulse that we so often hear of to, let's say, reform or make things better or, 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 or more just is itself one that, that is only possible by having a serious conversation about objectively what justice is. And in fact, you know, there's, we have lots of resources in, in our own tradition to engage in that conversation with, which precisely show that these are not merely subjectively defined or culturally contingent. Um, that's not to say that there may not be different approaches to the problems, but rather that there is a, there is a knowable reality mm. or ideal of what justice is, and I would venture to say that it's one that any human being is capable of recognizing. Yes. It's interesting to hear you talk about this and the idea of, of uh, I suppose, you've got a very kind of um, uh, optimistic view of humanity and a respect for humanity and the capacity of each human individual uh, to, to reach these heights. And I fear that that is, to return it to higher education, I fear that that is often lost. And one of the reasons I got so frustrated, particularly with the, the, uh, the study of English literature, is that it, there was so much uh, jargon and obscurantism and wordplay and, and the kind of um, edifices, linguistic edifices that are built up to keep people out. So it, precisely what you say, uh, a person says, I don't, Shakespeare's not for me, it's too, it's too complicated. And that I felt was something that was actually encouraged. And, and it should be the case that everyone can speak about these things with clarity. And I think if you can't do that, then particularly in the humanities, I think that's a problem. Yeah, oh, no, I think that this is, uh, clearly a massive problem within the humanities especially uh, and one that is a symptom of an underlying loss of mission and purpose yes. and uh, on what, the, on the what top is of, that what is that underlying well i mean I, I think the underlying mission and purpose in the humanities has yes. clearly got to be reflection on what it means to be human i mean that's yes. that <laughs> that's what the value proposition is. I mean, and if you're not doing that in such a way that is meaningfully able to connect with people as they understand themselves as human beings, yes. then I'm afraid you've, 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 you, you've, you've fundamentally lo lo lost your way. Yeah, well, I mean, just to give it a specific example. So I, 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 recently, I, I was talking about Judith Butler's writing and I, I stupidly got involved in one of those arguments online. And I pointed out that it, it's not good writing because it, isn't, it, it, it needn't be... Uh, so uh, unclear. It, 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 could be, it could be crafted in such a way because she's talking about things that affect us all, humanity, sex, gender, these kind of things. And uh, the retort was uh, to, to, to suggest, well, in mathematics, uh, you often get these very complicated equations that only those who are trained specifically in it can possibly understand. But that's not what Butler's talking about. That's not what she's writing about. It's not something like that. It's, you know, when it comes to the humanities, I just feel that we have to get back to a point where everyone should be able to be part of this conversation. I th well, I think good. that's completely right. And in the sciences, it's clearly the case that if you're a physicist or a mathematician or a biologist or whatever, working in some subfield that, you know, none of which are fields that I know much about, that I, it would not be possible for me uh, to enter into a conversation or read, let's say, an academic paper right. in those fields and make much sense of it. it. It is, however, the case usually that even in those cases, that the person who wrote that article mm -hmm would and should be able to tell me in layman's terms what it is about. Even in the sciences, it's not the case that the every man can't at least understand why this is important or what roughly it is. I mean, sure. the late Gunter Blobel, the, the Nobel laureate of, in, uh, in, in biology, who sadly died a couple of years ago, uh, uh, he always used to say to his graduate students that, uh, so, at least, so at least I've read about him, that if you can't you know, explain your work in a, in a sentence, this is, a, this is in, in biology, remember, yes. to, your, to your grandmother, then you know, maybe you don't understand it very well. But put all the sciences to the side and all, you know, turn to the, to, the, to the humanities, I simply do not believe believe that the humanities by and large uh, need to depend on such a, an inaccessible or subspecialist uh, uh, form, forms of knowing. There may be exceptions occasionally mm -hmm. if you're working with you know, linguistic theory or philosophy or sure. things like this. Sometimes it can get 
technical. I want to defend that possibility. But by and large, if you're talking about literature, if you're talking about um, uh, about the arts, I mean, you know, for goodness sakes, I mean, you, you ought to be able to. And frankly, you know, the great books written by historians or art historians today, you can go to the bookstore and buy them, and any person who can read can read them. Yes. And that, and when the when the humanities lose or insist on departing from expressing what they see about these works in a way that any sympathetic, thoughtful reader can appreciate, yeah. then I would maintain they have fundamentally betrayed uh, what they're about. Or, or indeed, the, the, it, smacks of, uh, an, 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 it smacks of fraudulence sometimes. Uh, I remember my supervisor at Oxford saying that sometimes these things were published because the publishers didn't understand what they were saying. And there, and there actually wasn't very much in there. And I think we've lost the idea that actually even literary criticism, say, is an artistic enterprise in, in and of itself. And the way in which you, you express your insights into a particular text can be a form of artistry as well. And I, that's why I really like reading some of the older uh, sort of liberal humanist writers on, on literature, people like C.S. Lewis, because I, just, I think there's, there's a joy to the way in which they express such uh, just such co complex ideas, actually, yeah. but with such a beautiful uh, clarity. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the ways you can see the fraudulence of some contemporary uh, academics is precisely by going back and reading mm. the best of the best scholars and thinkers of past decades, indeed past centuries. Yes. I mean, if you read uh, Dr. Johnson, or if you if you read Walter Pater, or if you read John Henry Newman, or if you go back further and you read, you know, Shakespeare and Marlowe, or further still and you read, you know, Dante and Petrarch, or further still and you read Boethius and Augustine, or, or go so on and so on and so forth. I mean, the highest watermarks of the past are by and large all works that any curious human being can encounter face to face. Now that's not to say that you may not need, you, you, you won't benefit from having someone who knows a huge amount more about that than you do. Someone who has zero knowledge at all I mean, yeah. talk about uh, uh, Sir Roger Scruton. When I spoke to him one time, I asked him, you know, what was a work of art that, you know, had been for him signally important? And he, he uh, spoke about uh, Bach's Mass in B minor, <laughs> which is, of course, a very, very complex work of music. Yes. That, you know, one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest composer of all time, labored over for a long time. So, you know, it's not low on the complexity scale, right? It's, it's high on the complexity scale. And yet I want to absolutely insist that anyone you know, with ears to hear, with no knowledge of music, with, with, who couldn't sing a note, who'd never studied the music, who couldn't even recognize a, uh, a, a note on a staff, yeah. can walk into and listen to that and be blown away and, and learn something and see something themselves. I insist that, I mean, I just walked by the National Gallery today. I think the same about painting, I think the same about, about, about all of the arts and letters, that they are fundamentally about what, what each of us is as a human being, and therefore, it is our birthright to engage those uh, uh, freely on our own. Are you optimistic about the future of higher education? I think it's, on the one hand, difficult to be optimistic about many institutions, given the direction of travel, yeah. given how they are governed, given uh, what their curricula are, given what the nature of their campus life is. At the same time, precisely for that reason, I think we're living at a time in which uh, which may prove to be quite exciting because yes. I think one thing we've talked about before, Andrew, is that there is a huge demand. I mean, whether it's people watching uh, this, uh, this show podcast or whether it's um, uh, uh, seeking out forms of, of learning and discovery in other places, one of the best things about our time is that people know that they're hungry. And once you know that you're hungry, you can go and find something to eat. In the short term, I don't think it's likely that we're going to see a lot of uh, change within the institutions of higher education that are already very degraded and, and uh, say, have lost or forgotten or betrayed their mission. As I say, I think there are others, uh, perhaps the University of Cambridge is one such, that are really in, in, in you know, fundamentally quite good shape. There's a vast opportunity now, and I don't simply mean in higher education, but absolutely in higher education, precisely because so many institutions have taken a wrong turn. Yes. I mean, if universities are meant to be the place where you can go and you know reflect upon uh, the nature of human experience and you know learn what others have said and you know think freely and be challenged what you think, um, if if they're meant to be in that sense the the the, the keeper the keepers of the sacred flame, the yep. place you can go to to reflect 
as richly as you can on the nature of human existence. And yet, in our time, I would say it is the case that the place the average person turns when they're asking those perennial questions about you know, love or justice or suffering or, or death or, 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 or sickness or whatever, the, the place the average person, I would say, now turns is not the universities, to make sense of that. That, to me, indicates that there's a fundamental historic mismatch yeah. between what the universities are meant to be and what, in fact, and of course there are wonderful exceptions, but the po what I'm pointing to is that, that you know, if you had, you know, you know, you, people who were meant to be providing, you know, food, that it was a supermarket or whatever, and that, well, there were still a few good supermarkets, but then by and large, what these were offering was not food. Yeah. You would say, well, uh, it, it, people aren't going to stop being hungry, but they're going to go elsewhere. Yes. There's a huge opportunity for people who are willing to actually, you know, give people the nourishment they are seeking. And certainly that's our intention in some small way at Ralston College. But what I would say is that there's a huge opportunity, not only in higher education, but more broadly uh, broadly beyond. I mean, I, I hear from young people every day, and not only young people, but who are, who are they're just seeking to live significant and meaningful and beautiful lives that have integrity and that are connected, that, that in which they can understand themselves in a context that as creatures that really matter. Yes. And, and I think what I say to those young people is that we need them. We need them to help us build and rebuild the things that will allow them and those who come after them to understand themselves uh, in that way. And in that sense, I think we're living in, a, in, a, in an enormously exciting time, but it all depends in some sense on our having the courage to actually do that. And if we, if we resign ourselves to, you know, death and destruction or alienation or cancellation or whatever, um, uh, we'll have a lot to answer for when, in fact, we have the opportunity and the tools at to hand to, to build and, and build again. So where can people find more out about Rolston College well, certainly on our website, which is at, uh, uh, you can just Google Ralston, uh, R-A-L-S-T-O-N, Ralston College, you'll come to our website. And uh, you follow our, 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 our podcast, our online courses, uh, one of which will be by yours truly at some point on yeah. Shakespeare. And, uh, and we have a you know, pretty significant uh, ambitions and plans for, let's say, while on the one hand we want to reinvent the academy, in-person degrees and all that kind of thing, the, the traditional structure of what the university is, on the other hand, we're looking to, to break down the doors uh, of the treasure house of humanistic inquiry so that anyone anywhere has, has, what, uh, has access to these, these works of, of uh, uh, perennial and, and uh, immense beauty and illumination. Anyone and everyone uh, uh, seeking to, to make sense of things. Stephen Blackwood, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Andrew. This has been the Free Speech Nation podcast with me, Andrew Doyle, and my guest, Stephen Blackwood. And I would highly recommend that you check out Stephen's podcast. It's called the Ralston College Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please do like and subscribe and come back next week when I'll have another fantastic guest. Farewell for now.